My name is Jeremy Devins of the Quiet Mind Yoga Podcast and quietmind.yoga, my website. And this is the Essential Pose Guide, where I'll be walking through several of the most common poses that I teach on my podcast, which is just audio. So if you want a little guidance on some of those poses, I'll explain those here. And if you just want to know a little more detail about some of the poses that I don't always get to when I'm teaching my classes, you'll learn that here as well. We'll go through six of the most common pose positions and then five of the most common poses in each of those positions. So right now we're already in a position, or at least I am, and if you'd like to join me now, we'll start here in a seated position, so sitting comfortably on your mat. So if you have some props for this, I'll go through how to use those as well. You don't have to have them, but they definitely help. And first of all, we have a yoga mat. I like the Manduka Pro mat. It's what I've used for eight plus years now and love it. And I also have some blocks and a blanket and a bolster and a strap or belt. Now you don't have to have all of these things you can do fine without them. You can use pillows, cushions, books, things like that around the house or actual literal belts. Uh, but I'll show you how we might use some of those. Starting with first pose we're going to look at from seated is Sukhasana, which means easy pose, which is just sitting cross-legged on your mat, which is not always easy for everybody. So one of the ways that can make it easier is to put something underneath your tail, which could be a block. Just sitting up on that, just like so, and I'll show you from the side just what you might imagine, uh, just sitting on there, and then having your knees come a little bit forward, so you're not leaning back where your knees are lifted and your back rounds. That could cause back pain over time, or a little bit of an arching of the back. So the pelvis is not tilting back, but slightly forward, which is called an anterior pelvic tilt here. So you can lean a little bit forward, even into your hands on your knees with that. And instead of a block, you could use a blanket, bolster, anything like that that's going to just elevate your hips. And if you're going to be sitting for a long time, like meditation, definitely recommend something underneath your tail to make it a little easier. And it doesn't matter which leg is crossed in front. It could be right or left. And there's lots of sitting variations that you'll see uh, like maybe one heel in towards your groin, the other heel in front of that, so your legs are more down to the ground. There's, of course, the lotus pose, which is more advanced, where you're crossing legs over each other. All right, you don't need to do any of these other variations. Usually in my classes, I'll just say like easy pose, sukhasana, or sitting comfortably, which for some of you might actually not be sitting cross-legged, is not comfortable. So you could sit kneeling as well if that's more comfortable. But usually sitting up on something helps a lot. Now from seated, the next pose we'll look at is a side bend. So that's just what it sounds like. You just reach one arm overhead and lean to the side. And you can do that from kneeling or from sukhasana. So same idea either way. And again, you could use a block here under your elbow. There's lots of variations I'll teach from here. But the idea is just to move your spine into lateral flexion or a side bend. The third pose we'll look at is cat-cow here, where you just put your hands on your knees and move your spine forward and back. So here, it's mostly in your thoracic spine, your middle spine that's moving. So inhale forward, exhale back maybe, or just moving at your own pace. But the idea is just to move your spine through its different directions of movement. And that's something I like to teach all the time, to always move our spine in all of its possible directions of movement. And you can make this more of a whole body kind of thing where you're really getting into it. Or you can make it a smaller movement just in your ribs and your thoracic spine. All right, so either way is fine. Either one is anatomically okay. It's listening to your body. Though. Some might feel better than others, some other variations. From seated, another pose we'll look at is very common is the head to knee pose, Janu Shirshasana, where you have one leg extend out, the other foot to your thigh, and you hold over that leg any amount. Now, the goal is not to grab your foot and pull yourself into the stretch and crank on it, right? That's going to possibly lead to injury. It's to ease into it. And 
you can emphasize more of your hamstring stretch with your straight leg or more of your upper back and shoulder stretch with a bent knee. And you know, technically it's head to knee pose or sometimes called head of the knee pose where we want this other leg's knee to be moving down towards the ground and the head towards the knee. So there's different interpretations of exactly what Janu Shirshasana means. Uh, but Janu is the knee, Shirsha is the head, Asana is the pose. So there's some connection of the knee and the head. Could be one of these knees, uh, but I think it's more of head towards the knee. And you go with the range that feels good for you. I'm not very warmed up, so I'm not going to go much further than that and actually feel a stretch already, and I can stay there. I'm going to go to the other side, same idea. So foot to thigh, the outer, the bent knee is moving towards the ground. If it's coming up a lot, then it is possible you might set up on a little bit of a blanket here to help with this. But you don't want to set up too high because that could hyperextend the straight knee where it's overly straight and locking out and possibly hurting the knee. Same idea here. And you can emphasize the hamstring, which is the most common, you'll see all the time. But I like to sometimes bend the knee and emphasize more of stretching the upper back. Because that's sometimes a tricky area to stretch and reach. But this is a good way to do it. And then the last thing we'll look at here is a twist. We haven't done any twists from sitting yet. So deer pose is one of my favorites. It's kind of uncommon pose, but you start in this sort of crab shape. So it's kind of seated. You gotta have your knees bent, feet on the floor, hands behind you. And I can see my tan line on my feet here. I'm doing lots of walking with shoes on in the summertime here in Austin. All right, so then you let your knees lower to one side. And so in this case, my knees to my right, left knee to my right foot. That's gonna stay there as I turn my upper body away from my legs and maybe lower down to my elbows into this is the deer pose so you can also even go further rest have your elbows apart and rest your head on your hands and it's not necessarily better to go further in any pose it's just different variations to explore right, and then the same thing on the other side starting from the crab shape knees to the left and right knee to the left foot turn your spine to the left and you come down to elbows or hands, and you can also use blocks or props here under your forehead. So that's the deer pose, and that is, are those are the most common seated postures. I thought I was really smooth in that transition. I had to redo it. All right. So the next thing we'll look at are kneeling poses or hands and knee poses, which you start, would you guess, on your hands and knees. And here, uh, I like to do this sort of just spinal movement thing. This is one of my favorite things to teach, just to move your spine in all directions. And it's just what it sounds like, so there's no right or wrong way to do it. And as a teacher, I'll just tell you, like when I'm teaching this and watching students, I'm kind of seeing if there's any trends. If everybody is like going towards a child's pose or doing sort of back bends or side bends, maybe there's some different things we want to focus on that day. Uh, but for you personally, just checking it and really exploring, it could be more of a twist. There's really no limit, but just kind of keeping in this boundary of hands and knees and then exploring what movements feel good from there. So it could be a lot of different things. And then child's pose is super common, and there's different ways you can do that, like knees apart, toes touch, hips towards your heels, forehead down. That's the most common one. The idea here is just to go into more of a resting kind of pose. And for some people, it's not so resting. So in that case, you might set up a little higher or not go as far back. Another variation is knees together, feet together, hips back towards your heels, and this time, arms reach back, palms face up, forehead down. So that's another version of child's pose. Either one is fine. There's slightly different feelings on the shoulders and the hips and the spine. Next most common pose is pigeon pose, which you probably do in just about every class you've been to. So from hands and knees is a good way to get there, where you just bring your right knee towards your right wrist, hips square to the ground. Now, some things you'll sometimes you'll see teachers say, maybe put a block under your 
hip, and looks like this. So let's say put a block there and then go down into the pigeon pose. Now, I don't teach that. I don't think that's particularly helpful. And what part of the issue might be that they're having a hard time. Uh, maybe if you're going into pigeon and you're leaning to one side or your hips are up high and it's hard to get any lower than that, better option and alternative is to go into this 90 degree version of pigeon where you actually lean over to your right side so now my whole right leg is on the ground. Bring my shin up to parallel to the front edge of the mat and my back leg up to 90 degrees. So we'll look at this from the other side. The same pose I just got to. So both legs are at 90 degrees here. And this is actually a great stretch for the same muscles we're focusing on with pigeon, just a different angle and it's anatomically safe as well. From here, you might just lower down a little bit to your hands, maybe your elbows, maybe a block under your forehead. And then to get to the other side, especially if you're doing the 90 degree version, it's a really nice fancy transition where you just go to the other side in one movement. So that's an option. And uh, for people with knee pain, this often feels great. If you have knee pain, you could do this version, or the supine version instead. So lots of options with pigeon to get that same outer hip stretch idea. So the supine pigeon looks like this, uh, but you do have to change positions, and it kind of breaks up the flow and smoothness of the class, but if it makes your knee feel better and the pose more accessible, and totally worth it. Right, so that's pigeon pose. The first standard version, uh, most people have, are okay with accessing it, and you probably are too, but if not, you can do those variations. It's just hips square to the ground, and you might come down to an elbow or to your hands with your elbows apart. One of the bigger things I see here is uh, a lot of shrugging of the shoulders, tensing up of the back, and uh, maybe something with the back leg being in a weird spot, but really just want your back leg straight back, toes pointed back. Pretty simple. And you don't need to get your front shin parallel to the front edge of the mat. That's kind of an older way of approaching pigeon, but it's not always the safest and not really necessary. Like if you have your knee more bent and you feel plenty of stretch in your outer hip, that's fine. Good place to be. Now, the next thing we'll look at here is a low lunge from hands and knees. So just step one foot forward, in this case the right foot, Left knee stays down, and you can bring your hands up to your thigh or to your waist, or arms up like a Y or W. So lots of variations with the arms here. And if there's any knee pain with this one, you just put a little blanket under the knee, and it feels much better. So if you get further into anatomy and learn, study anatomy with me or with other teachers, you'll learn how there's not much muscle around the kneecap. It's mostly connective tissue and bone, so it's really not meant to be stretched or really uh, not so good for putting all of our weight on all the time. Now, if you have like a Manduka Pro mat like this, it's pretty thick and pretty cushiony and also uh, firm and solid, so it's a perfect balance where I don't feel like I ever need a blanket under my knee, but just feels nice and if you like the extra cushion sort of like the Cadillac of yoga pose variations where you can put a little cushion under your knee and it feels a little extra soft and uh, it doesn't take away from the pose or the firmness or the stability of the pose at all. all right, so that's the low lunge on Janayasana. You can go to the other side do the same thing and there's different variations that I'll teach sometimes like pushing your back foot into the ground to activate your back thigh and glutes. The reason you might want to do that is to strengthen those areas, which are always good to strengthen, and then go further forward and down into the lunge. Now, that is going to make this a much more sustainable 
stretch for the hips and uh, helps you build strength and flexibility, which I'm a big fan of, so much so that I made this the logo of Quiet Mind Yoga. So I think it's such a cool pose because there's so many variations. It helps open the hip flexors, which are commonly tight if we're sitting a lot, one of the most common issues that a lot of us have. It can be a strengthening pose, pushing the foot down. It can be a stretching pose, going deeper into it. And you can go a lot of different directions from here with different variations, side bends, twists, high lunge. Right? So it's really kind of a central pivoting point where you can go in so many directions in your practice. And in my classes, I'll often give lots of variations and teach uh, some version of low lunge in pretty much every gentle or hatha or vinyasa class I teach. So that's Anjaneyasana. And now the last thing we'll look at from kneeling, hands and knees, is probably the most common yoga pose. You want to guess what the most common yoga pose is? I bet you, when I say it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, so while you're guessing, I'm going to go into the pose, start going into it, and maybe you can guess it now. Maybe you got it. All right, it's downward facing dog, Adho Mukha Svanasana. So most common pose, and there's actually a lot of stuff going on in down dog. So, first of all, your hands are going to be pointing either straight ahead or slightly out from the center. And that's coming from your shoulder being externally rotated. You don't want internal rotation of your shoulders here. That's pretty rough and down dog, not so good for your shoulders. So external rotation in the arms, slight internal rotation in your legs. So your toes don't turn in, but your thighs do. So your heels almost turn out a little bit. And another way you can feel that is if you put a block between your thighs and go into down dog and sort of squeeze your thighs slightly together and then turn your heel slightly out. And you feel how it's kind of pushing the block back. That's a little internal rotation in the thigh. Something I don't focus on too much, but it is good to be aware of in the pose. And it has just a nice little balanced kind of effect uh, with the external rotation in the arms, internal rotation in the legs. And then as best you can, your spine is neutral, which for my back is actually very, very difficult. And you'll see even in my pose, and I've done this a bajillion times, and from many angles, there's still a little bit of a rounding in my back. And if you have that, it's okay. One thing you could do is bend your knees more and feel like you're doing a cow pose, arching your back. And lift your upper back and then work on maybe straighten one leg maybe the other but usually when I teach this I'll suggest you can bend your knees one at a time you can shift weight side to side and you could take a wider stance if your hamstrings are tight and that's downward facing dog probably the most common yoga pose you'll encounter now we'll look at our next position, so we've done sitting, we've done kneeling. Can you guess another body position we can be in to move from? That would be standing up. So standing up, uh, usually we'll do mountain pose at the front of the mat. So I'm not going to cover that because that's just very common and uh, it's basically just standing. But there, we can go really deep in mountain pose, you know, another time. But since we already did the lunge, let's look at the high lunge, which is pretty much the same thing. But now instead of your back knee down, your back knee lifts. And hips are squared, toes pointing straight ahead. So I don't actually teach warrior one at all. It's not a terrible pose. You can do it if you want. But if you turn your back heel down in warrior one, and then try to turn your hips forward towards the front of the mat, which is often how it's taught, where your hips are supposed to be square to the front, but your legs are like warrior two, or your toes turning out. That puts a lot of the stress of the whole shape right into your right hip. And I know quite a few senior teachers who practiced for decades, and I know they did warrior one almost daily, and they had to get hip replacements later in life. Now, is it all because of warrior one? Probably not. But is it po possibly a factor? I would say it's possible. And is this a pose that we need to do that has some massive benefit over other poses? I don't think so. 
right? So the real benefit of Warrior One is the slight balance and strengthening of the legs, which you can get with the high lunge. Uh, there's a little bit of opening and stretching of the right hip, which you can get in so many other poses, including Warrior Two to a degree. So I just teach the high lunge, and it's a lot easier even to go from a high lunge to like Warrior Three or Warrior Two or lots of different variations to go through the high lunge just as much as, if not more than, Warrior One. Uh, so not a big fan of Warrior One, and I don't recommend it, but I do recommend high lunge a lot. And again, same like the low lunge, you can do all these different arm variations. Maybe you want to strengthen your back with your elbows bent. Maybe you want to rest your shoulders with your hands on your waist. Maybe you want a little more energy with your arms up like your Y. Or maybe you want a little more centering with hands and prayer. So many variations you can go through with this pose. Uh, so lots of options, twists, side bends, just like the low lunge. Now the next thing we'll look at is warrior two, where in this case, your back heel turns down, front knee bends towards your front middle toes, arms out like a T. That's warrior two. And the first few times I did this in a class, I was really shaky, and uh, it was about maybe six months later when I was doing Warrior Two, and it wasn't shaky anymore. It was like, wow, it got stronger. Right? And I'd been working out before that, and I thought yoga should be easy. This is just stretching. Of course, I can do that, but uh, it's different muscles, and it's using our bodies in different ways. So if you're shaky in the pose, just keep practicing, and the more consistently you practice, eventually those things will start to subside and your body adapts and sort of reshapes itself with the fascia and the connective tissue so that now warrior two is just about as easy as just standing in mountain pose for my body and maybe for your body as well at this point. And so the arms are not uh, shrugging up towards the ears. It's a little bit of a depression of the shoulder blades rather than the elevation. Your front knee is not internally rotating the thigh. That would put a lot of stress on the knee. It's slight external rotation of the front thigh. And you see your knee track towards your middle toe. Your back foot is probably the biggest thing that you'll hear different teachers talk about. Of Your back edge should be parallel to the back edge of the foot. Or your back foot should be in 45 degrees. Your hips should be turning out to the side or slightly angled forward, right? You'll hear conflicting things about this. And to really understand, well, what should I do? We want to look to the anatomy of what's happening in the pose. So the front leg is slightly externally rotated. The back leg, if it was externally rotated, we'd be going into some weird other shape. So we don't want that. We want the internal rotation. And if we keep our foot uh, in one spot and internally rotate the thigh, we're going to start to turn our hips uh, towards the front. So we find that spot that's more to the hips opening to the side. And see how my front knee kind of came in? Keep that knee opening out and keep this back leg. It's actually somewhere right in the middle of internal rotation and external rotation. It's more like it's slightly internally rotating while the front leg is externally rotating. All right. So your back foot, like mine, gets more to the parallel position, but for your body, it might be a little bit more forward. So both are correct. Your hips might be more to the side or a little forward. So both are correct. You just don't want to feel any major stress points on your joints, like your hips, your ankles. If you do, then you know adjust. So it's not going to be one size fits all for any pose, right? Depending on how your femur sits here and your thigh and your hip rather, uh, it's going to be different for everybody. Some people have a high angle or a straight on or different angles where it might feel better for your leg to be in one of those positions. So they're all correct. Any teacher who tells you that there's only one way to do it has not worked with enough students to realize that's just not true. Right? It's going to be dependent on your body and what feels right for you. And you'll know if you feel any major stress around your hip, your knee, your ankle. 
But for sure, that front knee, we don't want it turning in. We want it going straight ahead. The back foot is more adaptable, so I don't even focus on it in a class. I'll just say, uh, from the high lunge, turn your back heel down for warrior two. So everybody's going to have their back heel down. The angle is going to be different for everybody. So I should <laughs> do that on the other side and balance out a little bit. But you see the same idea. And the foot can be parallel, or for you it might be a little bit angled. Either way, it's totally okay. Now while we're here, it's really easy to get into triangle pose. All you got to do is straighten your front knee, hinge at your front hip, and there's a little bit of a tilt of the pelvis here. So the biggest issue I see with triangle is watch my ribs, watch my hips. So you're just doing a side bend now. Didn't move anything in the hips, it's all in the thoracic spine. And a head hanging down. All right, so this is pretty common to see. And the solution to that is to keep the ribs long, almost like a back bend. And imagine your hips are being pulled back, not just staying in one spot, but like there's a string pulling your hips back, and you keep being pulled that way. <laughs> But you keep the length in your sides, so you're not just side bending. It's a long spine, and it's happening at your right hip in this case. And then your hand can go to a block inside the foot or outside. Either one's fine. Or to your ankle, or just the palm inside your ankle, palm facing out. And then the key here with the upper body, with the top arm, is sometimes I'll see this. Now, maybe you can see what's happening here. So, take it away, bring it back. Take it away, bring it back. So what happened there? What's move, what movement is happening? That's just the arm, the shoulder, moving into what's called abduction or horizontal abduction. Now, that's not actually the movement we're looking for here. What we're looking for is more of a rotation in the spine. So I keep my arm just, let's say, just keep my arm beside my ribs. Don't turn it at all. And where do I go? So I'm going to rotate my ribs to the left. Right, that's it. And, and now I keep my arm in line with the ribs straight out. Turn my ribs towards the ceiling. And look up. Triangle pose. Right? So take it away. Bring it back. Take it away. Bring it back. So I keep my arm extended out, but it's really the ribs, the spine, that's opening up. And it's almost a little bit of a back bend, lifting the heart. And you can look up, forward, or down. Any of those are fine. It's not like you have to do one or the other. It's just looking up is going to be probably a little more energizing. Notice how it feels for you. Looking forward might feel a little more balancing, because you can look at a spot. Looking down might feel a little more grounding, because you're literally looking at the ground. You just want to watch your shoulders aren't hunching up here on either side. And more advanced with this is to have your hand inside the ankle, floating up, your ribs working, your core, your uh, obliques working here. So you're just kind of floating there. Right. And there's other variations of triangle, like in the Bikram style, there's you bend your knee in triangle, grab your big toe. Right? So. What I teach is the most common, sort of generally accepted versions. A lot of them have evolved from Iyengar's poses and Iyengar's book. So you can uh, do different variations if you want, but this is sort of the primary one that I teach. From there, to go into side angle pose, and just bend your front knee from triangle, bring your forearm to your thigh, and reach your top arm overhead in a long diagonal line. So it's just still warrior two legs, totally the same, but different upper body position. And again, not too much of a side bend, but more of a hinging at the hip. And then your top arm can do lots of variations. I like to do shoulder movements here, which is good for the synovial fluid in the shoulder joint. Good to do that every day. And you can go into a half bind or a full bind, or even to bird of paradise from there which I won't go into now, not warmed up. So it's not good to practice poses if you're not warmed up for them. It's one of the most common causes of injuries, yoga-related injuries. Uh, but you can also put your uh, lower hand to the floor 
or to a block outside or inside the foot. So the main thing here is the front knee over the ankle, moving towards the middle toe, not in, not too much out, and the warrior two footing, essentially. That's side angle pose from both sides and angles. <laughs> and then there's chair pose, Utkatasana. Another most common standing pose you'll do in most classes. So, you've probably heard your feet have to be together. Your knees have to be in line. Chair pose, you have to have your arms overhead, maybe you have to have your hands touching. All right, so those are all options. And you always wanna ask, if somebody's saying you have to do it a certain way, the question then is, why? <laughs> and anatomically, you wanna look at does that make sense anatomically? And for some bodies, 100% yes. For other bodies, 100% no, because of the angle of the femurs and different proportions and all these things we want to factor in that we just don't really know as yoga teachers and really even as students, the main way we really know if it's right for us is listening to our bodies. So for you, it might feel better to have your feet hips width apart or even slightly turned out and a good way to find out is just don't think about your feet at all and just do a little walking in place here. A little walking and try not to overthink it or try to do anything right here. And then just stop walking in place and look where your feet land. So for me, that's a little bit of external rotation there. And that's neutral for me. Another way to see it is when you lay down in Shavasana where your feet naturally go. So that's telling me where my femurs sit in my thighs, in my, in my hip sockets, and like how it is uh, affecting my feet and my position of my feet. So I know like when I'm at the gym doing squats, like having my toes slightly turned out feels way better biomechanically for my whole body than trying to maybe have my toes point straight ahead. So for you, toes ahead might be perfect. So it's gonna be different for everybody. That's why I say, Let's come into chair pose. Your feet can be hips distance or together. You can have your hands in prayer or arms up like a Y. Hold and breathe there. All right, so that's it. It's just real straightforward. For me, it's feet hips distance, a little bit turned out, hips back and down. So I get this bend where my knees can go a little bit past my ankles, but we don't want to go way far past that necessarily, which actually isn't a huge deal either way. Just don't want any knee pain. Uh, but more of your hips going back, like you're sitting into a chair, activates your quads, your calves, your whole legs, really, your hamstrings. Hands can be in prayer. Arms overhead just puts more stress on your back and your shoulders, making it more challenging. Hands together often puts more stress on the upper shoulders and traps, which are often already very stressed for a lot of people. So I don't teach that. I'll usually say arms up like a Y, or hands in prayer. And if you do arms overhead and your hands can come together without shrugging, great, right? If you can keep this upper traps area kind of relaxed with hands together, then that's not an issue. But if it tenses things up and you end up kind of rounding your back and shrugging your shoulders, it's really no good reason to do that. So let's just do the hands in prayer version. So those are our standing poses. So what are some other positions we can do? We've got three more left. So the next one that I'll often get to in a class when I'm teaching is to get to the belly or prone on the stomach. Now, there's a, not too many things we can do from being on the stomach, but if we get creative, there's, there's quite a bit we can explore. So the first most common thing that I like to teach in most classes is locust pose. And that starts on the belly. And often I'll go into it like from the belly, hands lift, heart lifts, legs lift. And now you can reach your arms back, palms face down for locust or any other arm variation if you want more challenge. So locust traditionally though, strictly locust is arms back, straight elbows, and I like to teach a very slight bend in the knees because that gets your hamstrings contracting, which we often don't get to do much in yoga. So it's great to find ways to do that. Uh, but pretty simple, straightforward, 
locus pose. Arms forward is going to be more challenging, puts more stress on your shoulders and back, just like in any other pose when you have your arms overhead, like the chair we just did. Next is Cobra Bhujangasana. So hands under shoulders, tops of feet are down for this one. Legs can be together or hips distance, depends on your body. Heart lifts, shoulders retract, and your head does not need to lift up here. Just keep your head in line with your spine. This is Cobra, and this is the floating arms Cobra. Your hands float off the ground, more strength in your back. You can press into the ground, lifting up higher. Just want to make sure there's no pain in your low back. It's not better or worse, just different variation, different angle. And then another thing you can add here is pushing down through your hands, pulling back at the same time. So it's a pushing down and pulling back to lift your heart. Right, so it's a more active version of Cobra. And it's good for strengthening these upper back shoulder muscles, which we can't really do too much of the pulling muscles in the back. Very important for shoulder health, for upper back health. So pushing down and pulling back at the same time. That's Bhujangasana. Then from there, upward facing dog is very similar, except one major difference. Do you know what it is? Your knees are not on the ground anymore. So this is Cobra. And just watch my knees. This is upward facing dog. Cobra, upward facing dog. Right, so the hips and the knees lower in cobra, and there are you, know, you can even do cobra lifting your hips, but that's pretty intense, and that could be a pretty sharp angle on your back, which might cause back pain. So I don't recommend it, but for some people it might feel good. But that's cobra. This is upward facing dog. Urdva mukha svanasana. So up dog, tops of feet are pushing down. Hands are down, and still you can sort of push down with your hands and pull back with the heels of your hands, lifting your heart. So your chest moves through your arms, shoulders back and down. Your head does not need to lift at an extreme angle, just at head in line with the spine. All right, so that's upward facing dog. And now everyone's favorite, Chaturanga. Now, fun little fa fact and side note and tangent is, uh, do you know the original name of the game of chess? The original name of the game of chess is Chaturanga. So, uh, four-limbed staff pose. So Chaturanga Dandasana is what we practice in yoga. Uh, but Chatur is four, and Anga is angle or limb. So four-limbed staff pose, but there's also four corners of a chessboard, and the game was a little different back then, but it's still uh, where we get our modern chess, so kind of fun. And uh, the actual pose is kind of challenging, like the game of chess. It's a game of strategy, where we want to know what we're doing and do it well. So Chaturanga, just going into it, usually go from plank to feet are not on the tops of the feet, so the toes are tucked, and from plank, chaturanga. So it's this four-limbed staff, right? So you see how my body, upper body, is like a straight line. Arms are bent to 90 degrees, right? Plank, chaturanga, plank, chaturanga. Watch the angle. There's a slight angle. My arms are going in. So I'm not just going from plank to so elbows straight out to the sides. I'm going from plank to elbows in alongside my ribs, which is much more anatomically sound for the shoulders and chest. So plank to chaturanga. Now, if you really struggle with chaturanga, and a lot of people do, one thing you can work on is using the wall. So plank at the wall to chaturanga, or you might actually kind of walk your feet in. So hands up, plank, and you kind of slide your hands down, chaturanga. So plank here, and you walk in a little bit, slide your hands down, chaturanga. And so it doesn't exactly translate to the wall, but that same action where it's not just chest to the wall, elbows apart, 
it's a, sort of an angle. Hands slide down, elbows come in. So you can work on that part of it of pushing it away from the wall a little bit, where you stay at that angle. And then you can use blocks. So you can put blocks under your chest, as many as you need for this. So plank to, oh, go back a little bit, plank to chaturanga. Plank to chaturanga. So it might be on your chest, it might be uh, more on your ribs, like I have here. Uh, so find the spot that feels like you could hold it there and you could put a little weight into the blocks and just get into that shape of the pose. And then maybe you just hover right above the block and then lower your weight and then push and hover right above and then back up. And maybe, you know, you don't want to really go lower necessarily, but if you start high, you could work your way down a little bit from two blocks to one block. All right, the goal is not to like touch your belly to the floor, <laughs> but to stop in that position where you're uh, a couple inches off the ground. Chaturanga. Tops the feet down to up dog is usually where we go from there. And then to tuck the toes back to down dog. So the hands, the arms are externally rotated and the toes are tucked, not on the tops of the feet. You can do it on the tops of the feet, it's just more challenging. It's totally doable. But that's Chaturanga and really just takes practice. Next is side plank. So we usually go there from plank, left and a little forward from center for side plank. Right. You can have your lower knee down, makes it easier. You can stack your feet, more of the standard version. You could raise your leg, more advanced. You could grab your foot and extend your leg, more advanced. And then I like to go into a back bend here, back foot behind you into a back bend there. So that's side plank. And uh, it's hard to talk and do these challenging poses sometimes. So same thing on the other side from plank, right hand a little forward from center, side plank, right knee can be down, left leg can lift. So lots of variations there as well. And the big thing is with that, to not go from plank to side plank where in that shape, we actually end up in more of this kind of angle if we just go right into it. So the reason I say put your hand a little bit forward from center is so when you get to your side, it's actually a 90 degree angle, which is more stable for side plank. So plank, I could just go right into it, side plank, and if I just kind of take my body off the floor, that's about the angle I'm at, which is not so good for the joints. So plank, to right hand a little forward from center, side plank. Now I take that angle with me straight out to the side, more solid base. Now, two last positions. Can you guess what they are? So there's balancing and supine. So balancing poses, the most common one is tree pose. So you wanna start from a solid base feet about hips distance, even if, you know, for everybody, for this case, hips distance because of where we're going. So hips distance, hands on your waist, turn your right toes out, right knee out as well, and you can stop at your ankle, calf, or thigh, or tree pose. So your knee, your uh, right knee in this case is not coming forward, it's opening out. Hands can be on the waist, it's easier, or prayer, or arms up like a Y, more challenging. You can even close your eyes to challenge your balance. So that's tree pose. You can use a wall as well for this same idea. No shame in ever using props or the wall. Like every body is different. We're all in different states, in different places day to day. So if you want to use props or walls, totally recommend it especially for these next couple poses like warrior three, it's a lot easier to get the shape at the wall 
you go into a sort of down dog at the wall, in this case, lift your right leg, that's warrior three. And it's a lot easier to get there than any other way. And you can work on bringing your hands to your fingertips, maybe one hand to your heart, maybe both, maybe different arm variations. That's warrior three where you're balancing on the one leg. So your hips and toes are generally squared ahead, not too much rotation in or out. But usually I'll get there from a high lunge, like we might go through a down dog to a high lunge to a warrior three lifting the back leg. It's a little bit harder, a little more work to get there. Sometimes there's a tree in your face and uh, so that's another way you can get there as well. Uh, there's a few other ways, but those are the most common that I'll teach. I really like the wall though, because it makes it so accessible for everybody. So you can try either of those. Next is half moon, which you can also do quite easy at the wall. So you kind of have your back to the wall, turn your right toes to your right, and lift your back leg leaning into the wall for half moon. Right. And another way, usually how I teach to get there is from warrior two. And maybe you have a block at the front corner ready to go there. So warrior two, right hand on your hip, left hand to left corner or block. And the biggest issue here is that back leg kind of falling down. So it's a lot of activation of your outer right hip, outer glutes. Always good. Who doesn't want nice firm glutes, right? So this is a great way to strengthen those. And then maybe you work on thus weight in your hand, so you're floating your hand. And you can do different variations from there as well. So that's Ardha Chandrasana Half Moon. Next is Dancer Pose, which again you can use a wall. So big thing with Dancer is to externally rotate, in this case your left arm, and grab inside of your left foot. So if you grab with Let's say you uh, internally rotate your left arm and grab inside of your foot. That's almost like being put into like a submission hold in martial arts or something. Uh, that's a bad position for your shoulder. Much safer position is external rotation, grabbing the foot. So if I push my foot out, basically just stretching my arm in a very safe direction. That works well with the anatomy. So inside of the foot, hinge at the front hip, right arm up alongside the ear. You can lean into a wall if you need to. I think it's a little distracting sometimes to use the walls, but uh, if it helps, use it. And that's dancer pose. So same thing on the other side, external rotation in the right arm. Grab inside of the foot, hinge at the waist. Your left arm helps counterbalance alongside your ear. And you push with your back foot, pull with your back hand, reach with your front fingers, and make sure not to lock your knee. So it's a little bend in your knee. That's not to Rajasana, dancer. And then there's crow pose, which is often called Bakasana. But uh, there's different variations of crow, different variations of what Bakasana means versus crane pose. It all kind of blurs together. So I just call it all crow pose, either with more bent elbows or more straight elbows. So either one is fine. But I like to go feet together, knees apart, hands down as if you're going into a plank. So from here, we go into a couple steps. So I'll go this way. Step one is to lift your tail. Step two, knees to triceps. Chaturanga arms. So just like Chaturanga, got bent elbows. Step three is to lift the heels in towards the tail, and that's usually the hardest part. And then you hold and breathe, you can point your toes here. You can work on straightening your elbows more, making it more challenging. And eventually you might shoot back through your vinyasa where you kick your legs back, which looks like this, if you're wondering. <laughs> so crow to chaturanga, to up dog, to down dog. And now, if you're most worried about falling on your face, which is a valid concern, you can have a block in front of your face. 
and everything else the same. So you get to that point where you're going to lift your feet and just drop your head to the block and work on maybe lifting one foot, maybe both, and eventually lifting your head, which is a bit harder from that angle. If it's hard to lift your feet, you can put a block under your feet. And same thing, perched, ready to go, and then maybe one heel in, maybe the other. Right? So that's the same idea with the crow there. So those are our balancing poses. You can balance on your feet. You can balance on your hands. And once you feel good with crow pose, you can work up to a lot of other balancing poses, different arm balances, different advanced things. So crow pose is kind of a gateway to those. And now finally, we go to our supine postures. That means on the back. And we've already done one of them, which is the supine pigeon pose, where you have your ankle over your thigh. And you might stay right there and just press your right hand into your right thigh and feel plenty of a stretch. If you don't feel anything there, you go into grabbing the left thigh or maybe the left shin, your hands interlaced. But if your head and shoulders have to lift and stay there to do that, you've gone too far. But if you can let your shoulders and head relax, then good. I also like to do a twisting version of this sometimes where you go hips to the right, knees to the left, just different angles to work with. So. Any of those are good. And of course, there's the other pigeon versions we looked at, but I like to find different ways to open all the major muscles from all the different positions. And this is one of my favorites. Another one is bound angle, where you have your feet together, knees apart. And you can also use blocks here. So if you notice your knees are kind of high up, and you open your knees, then you can put a little support under your legs. Or if you feel like your knees just go wide apart, and you feel a big stretch in your inner thighs, put a little support there, especially if you're going to hold it for a while, like a yin pose or a restorative class. You don't want to overstretch anything. And if you feel like the intense stretch, that's probably too much. You want sustainability. So Think about a green, yellow, red, like green stretches and yellow is about as far as we really want to go. If you get into the red where it's like, your heart's hard to breathe and it's like, I don't know if I can stay here much longer. That's actually going to create more of a stress response in your body and cause you to tense up more. So it's kind of exact opposite of what we're going for with the stretches. Uh, but if you're in that green zone, it's like, this is easy. I could stay here for quite a while. That's good, and even a little of the yellow where it's like, okay, I definitely feel that, and there's a stretch happening. Um, but we actually don't need to go to the yellow even that much. Right? It's actually staying in that green zone is really good. Uh, the inner hips are a good example. Like We don't want to overstretch there. That can cause pelvic instability and hip issues. So I like to stay in more of the green to slightly yellow range with my uh, bound angle because my hips are really open there. Uh, for the inner hips, for the adductors. And then we'll look at, if I can get vertical and see my notes, <laughs> quad stretch. Uh, so the quad stretch is where, you're, this is something I teach that, um, I don't think it has a real pose name, but it's a really good way to stretch the front of the thighs, the quadriceps. So from feet on the floor, you bring your right foot under your left thigh to your left hand and let your right knee lower down. So you, ideally, you feel a stretch on the front of your thigh. If you feel it in your knee, put a block under the knee to support so it's not pulling on the knee. And if you want more, you bring your left knee in to your right hand. And then there's other variations you can go to from there for more advanced students, like a twisting version, uh, extending the leg, things like that. But the main focus of this is stretching the, the quads. We'll go to the other side, bridge setup left foot to your right hand, lower the knee down, maybe bring the other knee in. And another option to intensify is to start that out with a block under your tail. So that just increases the angle of the stretch. 
which increases the intensity, which again, we don't necessarily need more intense. We want sustainable, we want to feel it, but not like in that red zone where it's painful. And I say this now because usually in this part of a class of like a vinyasa or hatha, I get into focusing more on flexibility because everything's warmed up. We've moved, the muscles are more receptive to it, the nervous system's more relaxed, or ready to relax at least. Uh, if we've done a bunch of sun salutations and things like that uh, in the class at this point, hypothetically. Uh, so now it's more receptive to stretching, so we want to be more mindful of like not overstretching at that point. All right, so the next thing that we're already in position for, if we take that block away, is bridge pose, Setu Bandhasana. So feet are about hips width. Just like with chair, you might feel more uh, like you need to have your legs wider, toes turned out, more toes straight ahead, legs closer together. That's all going to depend on your bone structure and your anatomy. So you'll know by how it feels. It feels like smooth and easy to hold. That's what we're going for. So you peel your spine up off the floor into bridge. And there's different angles from here. You can crawl your shoulders down and together, interlace your hands. You can press your arms down. You could activate your glutes here. I really recommend that contracting the glutes. Uh, make sure there's no pain in your low back, of course. And then different angles, like maybe you bring one foot in a little closer to center and the other leg straight up, pointing the toes. Or the other way, other foot. You could work towards the wheel pose here. Fingers point towards shoulders, elbows towards each other, and press into straight arms to lift your heart. And if you do that, slow and controlled, back down. And then we all go one vertebrae at a time, slow and controlled, back down. And that's bridge pose. And then usually I'll end with some simple twists, different variations of that. And I like to do like hips to one side, knees into the other side. So that stacks the hips and it might put a little less stress on your low back. Might not be a big deal, but I like to do that. And then same thing on the other side. So this is a little bonus pose. So we've got six supine poses technically. And uh, I can't go all the way to the side because that's where my microphone might shut off. So <laughs> you get the idea though, same idea, twist to that side. And then we go into final resting pose, Shavasana. The legs out, arms beside you. So I'm not too specific or strict about how to do this. And I think it really comes down to listening to your body again. Uh, for me, my legs naturally externally rotate. And sometimes it feels great to have arms overhead. Sometimes it feels better to have hands on the belly or to the side. Any of these are fine. And you might want to have like your props here, a bolster under your knees for a little support for your back might feel nice. So the main idea though is that you just stay in one pose and it feels restful and relaxing uh, ideally, or at least that you can stay still in the pose for a few minutes and we'll usually stay for a few minutes. So a good general rule is at least three minutes of Shavasana in a practice, if it's an hour long class. Uh, longer is sometimes better, sometimes not. So just listen to your body, but usually I'll teach at least three minutes in the classes that I teach, sometimes up to six or seven, usually not much longer than that for an hour class. So if you're here in Shavasana with me, you can just take a breath or two and kind of be in the pose. So the idea is to kind of release effort, be present. Your eyes can close or rest on a single spot. And then when you're ready, just start to make little movements of your hands and feet, arms and legs and eventually come back up to sitting at your own pace. And then I like to close with uh, Sukhasana Easy Pose again, where we started today, and hands in prayer to bow mind to heart and to each other. Thank you for joining me in practicing with this pose guide today. 
Really appreciate it, and uh, thank you for practicing. Namaste. So if you found this helpful, uh, be sure to subscribe to the Quiet Mind Yoga Podcast. Check out quietmind.yoga where you can join the membership and get hundreds of classes like this that walk you through many of these poses that you're now well prepared for to know what to expect. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me, Jeremy, at quietmind.yoga. And I look forward to sharing more with you soon. Hope you have a great rest of your day.